Hello, everyone. It's Francis Widdowson here. Welcome to the Rational Space Disputations. My guest today is Dr. Neil Finn, who is an anthropologist from the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to the Rational Space Disputations, Neil. Hi, Francis. Thanks very much for inviting me over. Yes, and I'm very, very excited to talk about uh, a number of matters today with Neil. Um, But for people who are unaware of the format of the Rational Space Disputations, what happens is that I invite a guest on every week or so, uh, someone whose work I find interesting or who I admire, And uh, for the first hour, I ask the guest questions. And then after the hour is up, I turn the controls over to the guest and the guest can ask me questions. And that's just to ensure that we can cover anything that was left out. And as well to sort of write the, if you wanna call it the power imbalance uh, that often exists in interviews to make sure everything is fair. Um, Anyway, so, Neil, I I admire a great deal because Neil is on the front lines of the battle against wokeism and has suffered some consequences of that. And we're going to get into talking about that uh, somewhat in this episode. But before we begin getting into those details, Neil, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your background, uh, what your research is and what you're currently interested in. Very good. So, uh, so I'm an anthropologist at the University of uh, Edinburgh. Um, and anthropology has for 40 years now been my home discipline. And for 35 of years of those years, I've been a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. As it happens, I'm feeling slightly different today because this is my first day of, uh, of retirement, uh, which feels a little odd. Uh, it's not entirely unconnected with the stuff that we'll be talking about. But uh, also, as you can probably see, I'm quite old, so maybe it's the right time anyway. Um, <laughs> I, so for most of those years, I've, I had, I've, for all of those years, I've had my home in anthropology, but I've always I worked from within and with lots of different disciplines. I've taught across lots and lots of different departments from the university. I've worked internationally as for 20 years as an international development consultant, so it was very generic. My mission in life was poverty reduction and the promotion of social goods, social progress, such as social justice, conviviality, social cooperation, so on worldwide. And particularly for 20 years, that was in poorer countries because that's where I felt most of my efforts would would, would bring fruit. Um, so I worked particularly in international development organizations, NGOs, I worked with trade unions and so on. And I taught in international development in, the, in uh, this university, Edinburgh University. I, I had a, my, my last big uh, career crisis was a, an entirely positive crisis. Uh, I decided that I had three small children, didn't want to travel so much. Uh, and I needed to find a new professional identity that would allow me to spend more time within a university rather than gallivanting around doing outreach work for half of the time. So the last 15, well, since the millennium, actually, I have gradually and then fairly quickly withdrew into academia and mainly worked uh, on the development of a kind of what I thought might become a new sub-discipline with anthropology, which is the anthropology of happiness. Um, I don't think that's been a huge success insofar as there are still not very many anthropologists who work on happiness and well-being, but there's a significant minority now, and I've enjoyed doing it, but I've probably worked more within social policy, sociology, where I think the the shift to focus on on well-being and happiness has been a bit more substantial um, uh, and a bit more enthusiastic um, but my my justification for that sort of started developing from about 1990 when i realized that although it feels very good and very noble to work on social justice and on poverty reduction you're working with the most vulnerable people and you're working on really pressing social issues to do with the remo- removal of 
suffering, the removal of, removal of unfair uh, adversity, and so on. So it feels good to cuff you, particularly if you come from a position of relative power and privilege, to go and do something for people who are downtrodden. But the the, the, the big but that kept becoming a bigger question mark in my head was, is this, a, is this enough? Is it enough to work on, to do research on things that go wrong with society and things that go wrong with people's lives? Is it enough to remove poverty? Or should we rather respect people as fully aspirational human beings and take seriously both their ability to be happy despite adversity and their wish or their aspiration to go a bit beyond just escaping from poverty uh, to actually live really well, you know, re live really good societies, li li live really good lives in really good societies. So I suppose one of the things that started making me perhaps become a little annoying to some of my colleagues, <laughs> and I think in a relatively light-hearted and good way, at least to begin with, was that I have pestered my colleagues in anthropology and sociology, but also in education, human geography, for a couple of decades now, by saying, look, please don't spend your entire lives looking at misery. That way madness lies, that way depression lies. If you want to, if you want to live well as a scholar, and also if you want to fully respect the people that you're working with, why not try looking at the stuff that goes really well with their lives? Even if they're the most downtrodden people in the world, why can't you actually work a bit harder to see what their strengths are, what their enjoyments are? And that actually, that idea, sort of first really came to me way, way back in the early days of my career when I'd, all, I'd worked in poverty reduction for four or five years, but then I did a PhD um, on a, a very traditional anthropological PhD on forest people in the Nilgiris in southern India who were ultra, ultra poor, among the poorest people in the world, high infant mortality, all kinds of horrors they faced. But I was very, like, many traditional anthropologists also very impressed by how well they'd lived mentally and socially despite all their hardships how they how they the strengths that they had in knowing how to enjoy themselves uh, to get along despite all the hatred and so on so that stuck with me and eventually i decided not to work mainly on poverty reduction anymore but i would work on happiness so that's what i did and i started the what was then the world's only anthropology of happiness course and I don't know if there's been any others since then but I've taught several a year for the last 20 years and loved it and, and the students have loved them they've been very popular courses mm. wow and uh, I'm just always curious about this and I've asked other academics this because I'm I'm always a little bit unclear as to w how anthropology is different from sociology or, or what distinguishes those two disciplines. And I was wondering if you had any uh, insights onto that as to how they're divided from one another. Yeah, so, the, so the, the differences are a bit distinctive in different countries. In North America, uh, you have four field anthropology, which also looks at sort of prehistory and linguistic anthropology. Um, cultural anthropology, which is is probably the nearest bit to British social anthropology. Um, but both in, and, and, in, and in Britain, British social anthropology uh, grew up as essentially the study of relatively small scale societies that in those days, when, they, when the discipline was being devised in the, in the 1920s and 30s, small scale societies that were also exotic to Westerners and were relatively non-metropolitan, remote, and as they were called then, primitive, simple, small scale, mm. where people lived in face-to-face, -face, often non-literate uh, culture, face-to-face -face relationships, and so on. And anthropologists traditionally would go and do, and this is the other main difference from sociology, anthropologists, because they were studying in these remote places, a long way to travel, they hadn't been studied much before, if at all, and there was a new and difficult language to learn that often hadn't been written down. So anthropologists had to do long-term fieldwork and they had to embed themselves. So that became a virtue of the discipline. Um, uh, and 
it was essentially a very, very white discipline, always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, white Westerners going to study uh, non-metropolitan people of whatever colour in whatever place um, mm -hmm. uh, and get get down with the locals long term, live as they did, as closely as possible to how they did, uh, understand things from their perspective. So cultural relativism was very strong in the discipline. Sociology, by contrast, was much was always much more focused on Western society um, and only relatively recently began to look at to expand to look at non-Western societies. Uh, and it was also typically focused on topics or uh, within those societies themes rather than just specific small scale populations. Mm. Um, methods also differed. Sociologists and particularly this applies to North America have tended to be more a bit more rigorous and statistical in methods, mm. more scientific, if you like, whereas cultural anthropology in North America, social anthropology in the in the UK and parts of Europe has tended to be a much more loose, um, interpretive, um, kind of feel your way kind of methods. Mm. So my PhD, for example, I just picked a people who hadn't been studied, turned up with my rucksack and said, hi, <laughs> I'm here to live with you. Is that OK? And they said, you're welcome. Here's your heart. And, <laughs> and I stayed for a couple of years and chatted and joined in. Um, huh. um, Interesting. Yeah, that's that's uh, I've, I've sort of sensed that, but I've never had to express that um, concretely before. Um, now, this is going to maybe put you on the spot, Neil, because <laughs> this Go is on. a major difficulty that I've I've encountered. What's your view on cultural evolution? Cultural evolution. So that's an interesting difference between North American anthropology and British anthropology. Yeah. There are only. I think two or three universities in the UK where anthropology departments pay significant attention to evolution. That's a terribly dangerous thing for me to say. And I, if somebody watches this, they will get in touch and tell me I'm wrong. But yeah. I, basically, our I, I forget how many anthropology departments we have now, but in general, our anthropolo social anthropology in the UK does not pay very much attention to evolution, which is I have to say is a weird aspect of British social anthropology. How yeah. can you take how, how can you take seriously the study of human sociality without looking at where it came from? Mm. Now there's been evolutionary speculation by sort of by default insofar as for example British social anthropologists like Americans who have studied uh, for example hunter gatherer societies have speculated as to the extent to which contemporary hunter-gatherers exhibit a lifestyle and an ethos and a, um, cultural values and so on that reflect those of human of ancient human evolution. Mm -hmm. But typically, those speculations have been frowned on by British social anthropology, mm -hmm. whereas the the responsibility to reflect on social and cultural evolution as well as on human physical evolution. I, I think it's been taken much more seriously in North America. Mm. But well, you, you I, see, I, you think as well. I, I can I, I can quite honestly state my my general view. If I had my career over again, yeah. I would pay far, far more attention to to human evolution than I did. I was brought up essentially in, in my discipline to ignore it. And that's yeah. a bad thing. That's a that's well, a significant... I think now it's a third rail. It's a third rail, definitely. A, like mm -hmm. this idea of the third rail. There's there's certain areas that you you kind of and then no one really says it to you, but you have a sense that if you start to investigate that, that's not going to be appreciated and it's mm -hmm. not going to be good for your career certainly, mm -hmm. and it could even result in you know more serious problems. Um, and now I think, uh, from what I can tell in terms of my own, because of course my, my work is premised on accepting the cult, the, the theory of cult, theories of cultural evolution. And I've, I've, I've studied them quite many of the thinkers, the most important being, um, V Gordon child mm -hmm. is the most important evolutionary thinker, recent evolutionary thinker. And of course, Leslie White and, um, Morton Freed. Yeah, mm -hmm. those kinds of 
thinkers and and that is not really acceptable in politic in my discipline which is political science um and anthropology i'm sure uh there's certain uh you know places that are very difficult to go to the the only person that i'm familiar with recently who who kind of explored a lot of these cultural evolutionary ideas quite successfully was was robin fox okay uh, at Rutgers. So University. So I was taught by Robin Fox at Cambridge, uh, oh. in the, right back at the beginning of the, just shortly out, I think at the, around the time he was writing that book with Lionel, I think he wrote, co-wrote a book with Lionel Tiger, yeah. so Tiger and Fox. <laughs> uh, uh, so he was an exception in my undergraduate days, that was a real exception, he stood out. Yeah. And he, I was delighted because he was, I, I thought when I chose, because I shifted from, I did two years of modern languages at Cambridge. Yeah. French and German, and then uh, shifted to to anthropology. And I thought it was going to be mainly about evolution, and it wasn't. I still found it fascinating, so I didn't really mind. Mm. But yeah, Robin Fox, I was fascinated by. Yeah. There's another Robin actually in in the UK, Robin Dunbar, who's oh. who the, of the eponymous Dunbar's number, who uh, who has contributed quite a lot to sort of linking social anthropology with evolutionary studies. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But there aren't there aren't many in the UK. Doing that, I don't think there's many in the U.S. At least, uh, not that I'm familiar of, with. So, um, anyway, so that's very interesting. Um, and then I wanted to ask you a political question. Um, so, like, do you, how do you see yourself politically? Do you see yourself as a as a socialist or as a reform liberal? Someone who thinks that you know it should be we should have the kind of the Scandinavian model, or what's your kind of perspective on that? So that's something that has, uh, I think, has changed quite dramatically uh, for me since the last, well, not that dramatically, but a bit dramatically uh, since the past year. So last a year ago, as we'll probably come to talk about, I, I got politically attacked for supposedly having views that were politically unacceptable in anthropology. And that was a bit of a shock to me, and we can get into that, but uh, for now, the, the, the interesting thing in response to your question is, uh, until just a bit over a year ago, I would not have minded if someone had called me left wing. I really wouldn't have minded. And if, if you had, if, if you'd forced me to choose, I'd have said, yeah, I'm left wing. I will not identify as left wing now, and I doubt I ever will again. <laughs> and I have a kind of much more strong sense of why it's important not to. Mm. Um, so my first, so so i was attacked for my political views and one of my first things to respond was to go on twitter and say look if you've got objections to any aspects of my political opinions my cultural values whatever it is that you've decided that you don't like about me ask your question here on twitter get in touch with me arrange a meeting to talk about it but for now let me tell you i have a range of views on many, many things. Most of those are open to change in response to evidence or debate. I, I am definitely neither left wing nor right wing. Mm. I just take each issue as it comes. And that was a kind of immediate insight that I, I had that I suppose had been rumbling along. And now I, I think that's a really important principle uh, for me anyway. Mm. You know, I, I, I fought for social justice throughout my career and will try to do so in my post-academic career but I don't want to do so from a left-wing perspective because I see the identification as being on the left as a slippery slope towards lazy groupthink. Mm. That if you identify with left or with right, you, um, you pigeonhole yourself as a certain type who's expected to have certain types of opinions. Mm. And I don't want to do that. I want to take, you know, whether it's voting in the government or deciding whether or not a transgender women should be allowed to take part in women's sports or whether or not a, a cutting foreskins off baby boys is a good thing. I want to be able to make my mind up in a, by, by looking at reasons, by looking at feelings and by looking at evidence mm -hmm. and not by allying with any particular uh, categorized political tendencies. Mm. And uh, capitalism, like, how do you see capitalism? The the uh, is it? Do you think that that is a 
a functional system and just needs to be kind of reformed or or do you have sort of a more critical view of capitalism so um i think that's something also that my views have changed slightly over the years i think in my early days as a social activist when i was probably initially starting to work primarily for extremely poor and underprivileged communities and i was probably a little bit more young and idealistic i and more strongly identifying then as left wing um you could have confused me you could have said probably I, I was anti-capitalist. I, well, I wasn't quite, but I was probably, you know, more critical of capitalism. I was also probably more allied with green politics then than I am today. Um, I, and so my critiques of capitalism would have been stronger in my early career than they have been in my later career. Mm. I what changed that? Well, experience in international development changed that because what, if you take just India, a country that I know reasonably well, worked a lot in from the 70s through uh, to the, the, the early noughties, the transformation of that country from extreme poverty to being a middle income country, still with lots of social problems and inequalities, but basically a much, much more comfortable country to live with much greater life expectancy, mass education, nearly full literacy and so on. Um, I, I saw that as largely the fruit of India opening up its, uh, opening itself up to world markets and essentially embracing capitalism. And mm -hmm. so, I, and so whereas I would have started out from a fairly tra traditional British social science, anti-growth, uh, anti-capitalists, and to some extent, at least implicitly, anti-Western ideological position, I actually saw the fruits of systematic and deliberate capitalist growth mm -hmm. and saw how much it, at least initially, transformed people's lives for the better. Mm. I would never be uncritical of capitalism. Yeah. So I'll take a, a more extreme example of that would be Bhutan, where I've, I've worked with the government recently. So they declared themselves essentially almost anti-growth and anti-capitalist in the early 70s. But when they started to open up, then they declared that the gross national happiness was their thing, or the king declared this for them, rather. Yeah. They, were, they were aiming for gross national happiness, not gross national product. Um, but actually, at the set, fairly soon after that, they opened up their borders, uh, started trading more with India, China, with the rest of the world. For many years, they were one of the world's fastest growing economies from a very low base. Mm -hmm. And as a result, their population became healthier, better educated, more politically informed, more democratic, and basically better off. Mm -hmm. that, so looking at stories like that really changed. Yeah. And, and but do you, do you think it's sustainable, like indefinitely the kind of capitalist sort of system no okay <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i founded our university's a uh, um, first uh, under, uh, undergraduate degree in sustainable development i've always yeah. been had an eye on sustainability and yeah. in the long run something has to give and yeah. i'm also very aware that the long-term trajectories in capitalistic growth tend towards concentration of power yeah. uh, and, and extreme wealth in the hands of a few and that that has to give so there's always so the only way that i think capitalism can be benign long term is to have strong democracies that are continually posing big questions moral questions and practical questions to business leaders uh, about sustainability and to the super rich about what are they going to do with their wealth Mm. So you're going to need some equalizing mechanisms and there's always going to be people less fortunate than others for a huge variety of reasons and you need a strong um, a welfare state to, to, to deal with some of those issues. Yeah. Um, but uh, and, and of course, uh, some of the environmental problems we face and not just this is not just global warming, but, yeah. but other things like urban pollution and noise and so on are products of a capitalistic system for the perverse outcomes of competitive market economies that um, I, I think we will always need to be questioning those critically and I uh, would we'll always need a government action to to curb the perverse outcomes mm -hmm. but largely I think capitalism free markets uh, are generally 
have so far in a way generally been a force for the good and I see no reason to think that they're all malign in the long term but there will be some aspects of that growth that we have to challenge. So as much as I'd like to continue on this uh, on this subject, I don't want to miss the discussion on your case. And so I'm going to just restrain myself and um, ask you to tell us, uh, well, you kind of hinted at it a little bit there by saying that you no longer call yourself left wing uh, due to some of the things that happened to you. I was just wondering if you could just briefly tell us what occurred with respect to your your case so so the immediate thing that happened was incredibly small scale and local and on the face of it trivial um, towards the end of the long period of repeat lockdowns in the uk so spring uh, 2021 yeah so la so last year basically 15 months or so ago april 2021 I was one of my students got in touch and said, Neil, I think you need to have a look at this Instagram site and this <laughs> Facebook site. You're being attacked by this bunch of anonymous students. So they seem to be being a bit unfair, but it looks like they've organized themselves and they're going to try and get you sacked. So that was just completely a bolt from the blue. And I was baffled, but it's a shock <laughs> to the system. And especially if you've led quite such a cozy life as I have, at least my academic life has been really pretty, you know, banal and cozy and comfortable and easy. I'd never had a single serious problem ever about anything for 35 years. I just taught, helped people through their studies, supervised thousands of people, I dealt with thousands and thousands of minor problems here and there in students with students progression, but I'd never had a never had a complaint. Or <laughs> it was just weird. But I wasn't able to laugh it off because they were saying I was a racist, a transphobe uh, and a misogynist and an all round bigot and that my values didn't align with those of anthropology and that I had to go. And that if I did, if the university wasn't going to sack me right away, that, um, that they would have to force from me a public apology immediately um, and I would have to be re-educated. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so I knew enough about cancel culture to know that this is how things go and this is not going to get any better, right? But I did go and in, I had never used Instagram. I was on Facebook, but I had never used it. And I went in both of those, looked at the sites and addressed the anonymous people, some of whom had single single word names, but none of the, none of the names I knew. And I was teaching 800 students online that year so I didn't know any of them and none of them evidently knew me <laughs> but um, I but none of them had had the courage or the insight or the curiosity to ask me first <laughs> about these opinions so it turned out that the opinions that they were ostensibly objecting to were things that I tweeted mild queries about the cultural relevance of Black Lives Matter to to UK in general, to Scotland in particular, mild queries of some aspects of transgender activism, a, a mild query about whether women's public safety would be improved by a curfew on all men, which had been proposed as a semi-serious proposal, rhetorical but semi-serious, in the House of Lords in the wake of one unfortunate public safety incident. So these were you know, really mild things. And then what was that? There was, a, there was one, I mean, it was a stupid little, hard, but completely harmless joke. I think NASA had said that they were gonna come up the next day with a really important surprise about the moon. So I speculated, what's this surprise gonna be? You know, <laughs> green cheese, blue cheese, or is the man in the moon non-binary? Um, <laughs> and just the mere fact that I'd used the word <laughs> non-binary in a yeah. joke. Yeah. Oh, we must be a transphobe. And then someone then checked up and found out that I had publicly tweeted in support of J.K. Rowling saying, you know, I don't believe she's a transphobe. I think the questions she's raising are important. You know, so there was nothing serious there uh, and there was nothing in my work for them to question. It was it was completely baffling, mm. but it fitted with a pattern 
and I knew it was going to get worse, and so did my employers. Um, so I said, we better have a conversation with these students, even if they're anonymous, you can put them behind a screen if you like, but I really want to talk to them, to have a conversation, because to remind them that you're here at university to have conversations about these political issues, not to uh, basically toe a particular party line and denounce people who don't quite meet, meet with your values. Um, that request was denied, and instead <laughs> I was suspended. Now, you, you've been there, <laughs> you know how this got now several people at that, at that. So one of the newspapers picked up on it because I immediately, instead of hiding, as a lot of academics do when they're bullied in this way, yeah, yeah. I just said the only, the only way for me to salvage myself is to actually just stick my head right above the parapets and say, here I am, shoot me down with whatever you like, I'll answer anything. I have nothing to regret nothing to apologize for unless you can find something else right yeah. and meanwhile i also tried to do what i can to find out what was actually really behind these things and it turned out i, I it was it had a two-year history particularly related to two big events where i had been a very rare voice of kind of i guess counter insurgency if you like within the university there was a a North American style race hustling event at University of Edinburgh that was yeah. a real shocker about yeah. two years before called Resisting Whiteness, <laughs> where um, it was supposed to be anti-racist, but it was called Resisting Whiteness and white people initially weren't allowed. And then yeah. they were told, well, we better allow white people in. So they said, all right, well, you can come, but you can't join in the Q&A. Uh, or at least if you do, we won't give you uh, the microphone. And by the way, you're not allowed in any of our safe spaces. They are all for people of color. Mm. So I was really shocked to see this happening, but doubly, doubly shocked, far more shocked to see the lack of official response and even the lack of informal response from my colleagues. Mm. I just thought everyone ought to be shocked by this. Yeah. This is a radically new departure. I've been, I actually been associated with the university since the early 60s because as a small child, I came and went and met international students, including a people of color who were rather rare in Scotland in those days. And yeah. I thought we'd done incredibly well in contributing towards benign race relations in the UK. And this was a terrible retrograde step. Yeah. So I, I was horrified, disgusted and cross. I, and I didn't say anything particularly inflammatory, but I just said, please, if you're going to do race relations, <laughs> do it with something a bit more aspirational than slagging off white people. Yeah. Uh, do it in a slightly less divisive way. So that was one. Yeah. And then the, there was another one, I, absolutely at the height of the, I, the first pandemic lockdown phase when the George Lloyd, George Floyd, event happened and the UK took it very seriously and everybody was out mar joining BLM marches and actually, you know, including my three offspring and um, a, so a tremendous amount of sympathy for anti-racists anti in, in, in the USA and we wanted to show solidarity with that. Yeah. All great, but it was done in terribly naive and often very inflammatory and racially divisive ways. Yeah. Um, uh, and one of the outcomes of it, people felt going on a march is not enough. We need to be tearing down statues. This is our moment. We need, and uh, you know, it's understandable how it happened, how it exploded so suddenly, because it wasn't just George Floyd. It was also millions of extremely angry, disaffected youth mm. suddenly being given a chance to get out and, and demonstrate. Mm. Although it was technically illegal because they weren't, you know, we were in lockdown, but yeah. and so so Edinburgh students started saying, so what what statues can we te tear down? And they discovered that uh, we have a David Hume tower. Now you can't te tear a tower down, but you can take David Hume's name off it. What was wrong with David Hume? Well, he had in 1743 or something put in a footnote saying that he was speculating that there might be racial differences in capability and intelligence. Well, this was a Scot, a Scottish philosopher, 
in the 1740s, Godfather of the Enlightenment, you know, trying to take conversations forward and learn about human diversity. Yeah. He didn't mean any harm. In yeah. retrospect, of course, it was disparaging, short-sighted, <laughs> and yes, racist. But not, not a reason to denounce David Hume. Not a clever target, given that you know a nearby building was, you know, the, uh, the, there was a, um, a King Khalid mosque and a King Khalid lecture hall, funded by contemporary Saudi Arabians. You know, if you wanted to pick people to cancel, uh, I think s s contemporary super rich Saudi Arab Arabians might be a better, a more promising target. Yeah. But anyway, so, oh my God. so when was the um, resisting whiteness event? So that was a, I think it was late 29, 2019. So okay. a couple of years before. And yeah. the David Hume was like in the first phase of the pandemic, 2020. Yeah. Right at the height of the BLM explosion in, in, in Europe. Yeah. Because yeah. have you heard of the, the, the case of Evergreen State College? Yes. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm trying to remember the chronology, but certainly I was aware of, of what had happened yeah. there. And I had, at some point, I developed kind of nightmare visions of the same. Yeah, happening. so, and people, everyone should look at this, who's interested in this, uh, these, these circumstances unfolding. There's a 24-part documentary on YouTube by Benjamin Boyce, who's a, who was a student at Evergreen and then mm. became... Um, a friend of Brett Weinstein, who's the mm. who's the major player in Evergreen, who who was the only one, or there might have been a couple of people, but he was pretty much alone, standing up to the absolute craziness that was going on there, yeah. and a lot of these kinds of things. You, you and I, I watched the whole documentary, and as I was watching it, I started to really become alarmed because I could. I could see some of the very similar things that were happening and, and, and they're very similar to what mm. you're talking Well, the, the resisting whiteness event. Yeah. And we had actually ourselves at Mount Royal in, um, it was in 2021. We had a, the loudest silence, anti-racism open mic was the name of mm. the event, um, which was, hosted by the students association and um and these events just are very uh kind of uh disturbing because they have students who are very um obviously suffering some from some kind of mental health problems who have latched on to the anti-racism material and they they just go on and on and on and then when it actually comes down to what has happened, it it turns out there's really there was really nothing that, that hmm. was racist at all. It had not it was perfectly normal kinds of things. Um, in the case of the Evergreen one, it was Weinstein sort of similarly doing what you were, but actually it was worse in his case because they told white people that they should stay away from campus for a day. Yes. So they changed it from a um, black or people of color would not come to campus to show their importance. And, and Weinstein had always been a supporter of that and everything. If you hmm. wanted to draw your labor and not come to campus, but then they changed it one year. And I don't know what the year was. It might've been 2017 um, to white people stay away. Yeah. And, uh, there was a whole bunch of things like they'd have events and they'd have food on a table and say, like, this food is for people of color. White people can't eat the food. Like this very, very kind of, you know, obviously turning the, what they consider to be this hierarchy of oppression on its head. And now it's going to be the, it's now it's going to be the time of people of color to oppress yeah. everyone else as they've been oppressed for so long. Um, anyway, I think that, that there's, there's these kinds of, things which have which happened around this period going from the kind of anti-discrimination kind of frame to uh an inverted pro-discrimination kind of yeah. frame and it sounds a sure. bit like that's what happened with 
So, so I, I did, I, I did follow the the Evergreen story. I can't remember when I was first aware of it. But certainly, I, I saw it as extremely relevant to what was happening in Edinburgh. Yeah. And the, the things that I admired about Brett Weinstein's stance, because I obviously felt a sort of certain kindred spirit yeah. with, with him and what he what happened there. He was somebody who had, you know, been like me, str strongly, strongly sympathetic to the overall cause yeah. of. of yeah fighting racism and promoting better race interrelation relation, relations and so on. And for that very reason, objecting when the so-called, when people on, under a mantle of anti-racism do racist stuff. So he was objecting there. So I, I, I liked his interpretation of what was happening. I thought it was absolutely right. Yeah. I liked the fact that he was a brave whistleblower, not afraid to actually say enough is enough. This is not a good direction you're going. Yeah. Um, I and I, I I suppose I naively thought, although things have got a bit bad in, in Edinburgh, they, they're never going to get like that. And actually, they're not <laughs> quite like that. But there were some North American students I, who teamed up with some British activists who organised this uh, resisting whiteness event that was clearly very much on a North American campus model. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was something that was pretty new to the UK. Mm -hmm. We've obviously had we've had some some bad race relations at times, and with things that have not been perfect uh, for many years. But what we haven't typically had is that really stark, divisive form of race baitery. So that was something that I th something I felt was sinister and new, mm -hmm. and I felt it absolutely crucial. Now I did my complaining in a very quiet way. I just got in touch with first of all the organize any of the organizers that I knew or even those that I didn't. I just got in touch and very quietly said, "Please, please, just do this next time in a nicer way. That this is not going in a good going to end end well." Mm -hmm. And most of us would be absolutely on your side if you didn't do it in this divisive way. And then the second thing I did, there was a, it had got some bad press and I noticed about 15 of my immediate colleagues had signed a thing in the newspapers basically saying it was terribly unfair for this resisting whiteness event to get the bad press that it had done. We should understand that there were people of colour and therefore they were underprivileged and we had no right to criticise their approach. Well, I thought that was a, a stark and astonishing example of the bigotry of low expectations mm. that you know they were basically with, with they were with withholding their moral judgment on the event simply because they thought some of the organizers were people of color therefore we should cut them more slack mm. and again i quietly got in touch with all of them and said look let's have a talk about this but you know that that's not right mm. and and if if this became a slippery slope would you really want next year in our courses on race relations, would you want the class to be divided between black and white or white and non-white? Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you really want uh, white people to be excluded from safe spaces in our school as a matter of, and none of them would answer those questions. Yeah. But they just, they clearly were annoyed that I was asking questions that they thought shouldn't be asked. Mm. And so that gave me a fright. And you mentioned um, that you, you suggested after there's this blow up about your Twitter activity, which appears to be to some extent related to these two, you're your kind of uh, asking questions. And, and it mm. actually was, you know, you weren't even sort of publicly, you know, criticizing it. You were, you were trying to be a, a person <laughs> who was consulting and not being overly aggressive in your opposition to it. Um, in terms of your, your, the administration, they, they would not have a, have a forum to have a discussion about it. Is that correct? No. And I, I, I mean, I hope that my colleagues have learned that lesson because I've said it so many times over the last year. Yeah. We have a, so we have a university policy, we have university policies that are relevant to these things, policy and academic freedom. That yeah. means someone in my position should be, should be defended. Uh, we have a policy on uh, on um, respect and dignity. So if people say extremely disrespectful people, like gratuitously calling somebody a racist and a misogynist, and a, you you can't, you mustn't do that. There's a clear policy on that. Mm. Um, I, 
and uh, we have a policy on um, a, on a social media usage for students and staff. You you know uh, you don't don't abuse the power that you have in social media. They had clearly abused that power, and we have a policy that I didn't know about on um, on mediation, which says it's just common sense. But if you have arguments that you can't immediately resolve through normal everyday conversation. What's the next step? You go for mediation, right? So mediation is a step that's meant to kind of resolve things, diffuse a situation, generate new understandings before it gets to open public disputes or worse still suspensions, litigation, resignations and so on. And, you know, on day one, I asked for that next step mediation because I thought there's a, you know there's, a, there's clearly a gang here mm. I who have misunderstood my tweets or misunderstood who I am or just simply are intolerant people who who don't tolerate my views either way we need to have conversations you know we need to meet you can't let that fester mm. uh, and then if possible we need to make that a kind of a a, a, a learning point for the university because there are these signs that some areas of the university are going in a bad direction. So we need to get this out in the open after we've had those mediated discussions. And we, I, I wasn't allowed to have mediated discussions. And that was a mistake, you know. The reason, you know, if you want to be charitable towards people who made those decisions, the reason was that we were still in, in the COVID pandemic. Students were generally estranged from the university and from their professors. Uh, feelings were running high about all kinds of things. And particularly on volatile political matters, uh, they knew that things could get a lot worse. I knew things could get a lot worse. Mm. Um, so in their defense, I think they were trying to protect me. Yeah, they thought they should protect me from mediation because mediation wouldn't go well. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I agree with you there, Neil. Well, um, I mean, there were, there were no doubt they were also trying to protect the university. Yeah. But I think that was, I, I trust that that lesson has been learned, that if, if something similar happens again, mediation will be used because human beings, even though they have very... Um, you know, often are, are, are very quick to hate one another and to disagree yeah. very strongly, uh, are generally better at talking face to face than they are at typing away po political debates on keyboards. Yeah. So if you have med mediation means two things, that ideally you come face to face, and secondly, you do so in a neutral space, and thirdly, you have a mediator who actually is there, is, is a skilled mediator who who, will try and make sure that things stay as friendly as they possibly can and as as calm as they possibly can yeah and so I, I can't say i know of lots of great examples of successful mediation in similar circumstances but i i still have faith that in theory mediation would work would have worked if they if we'd done it yes um and the reason why i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna push back here a little bit is because of wokeism mm -hmm. so uh, and this is, I was meaning to talk to you about this uh, as well. Um, wokeism, in my view, doesn't accept rational discussion. It's opposed to rational discussion. That's its nature. It's not a bug in the system. It's the system. So if you've got wokeism that is taking over the institution and the administration to some extent is wrapped up with all of that, uh, the, the discussions, they're not going to want discussions uh, mm -hmm. to happen. Uh, do you think that that has anything to do with what occurred? And I certainly, with my, my views about Mount Royal, because I, I was at it, like, unlike you, who was a guy who never, ever had any, you know, inter interactions, these negative interactions, I'd been involved in it since the 90s. So mm -hmm. um, I was very battle, <laughs> battle ready. I had yeah. I had dealt with this for many many years, so I I wasn't I wasn't uh, taken by surprise. I was completely ready for it. So, um, but in your case, you know, it's it's like it's a bit like a deer the deer in a a, a deer in the headlights because 
you cannot believe and and as well like um, i'm not sure if you know who mark mercer is but mark mercer is the, is the president of the society for academic freedom and scholarship mm. and that's i'm a board member for that organization mm. the most important organization in canada for protecting freedom of expression and, and academic freedom it, unfortunately it's not very well uh like it, it doesn't have the clout that it should have because it's a lot it's a vo completely volunteer organization and it just the people we just don't have time to devote you know the, what's needed to, to it but anyway mark mercer was that kind of person who w just had always given everyone the benefit of the doubt and uh his administration just um basically threw him to the wolves like it was mm -hmm. and he's still you know kind of you know to some extent traumat like i don't know if that's that's too strong a word but you know certainly had his faith in the institution and its ability to protect him rattled because he did nothing absolutely nothing mm -hmm. and they just were just this terrible autocratic you know because of the wokeism and it's got to be accepted regardless of the arguments that are mm -hmm. at stake um is that do you see that as playing a yeah, role so so your description of me as the the deer in, in the headlights is absolutely spot on <laughs> that's exactly how i felt even though i kind of i i i knew the trends and nothing about yeah, no, cancer, no. the cancer culture nature of the event surprised me it just kind of i had no prior experience and I remember one of my first thoughts actually was took me back to 1989, and I think it was around then, I think one of his first interviews after the fatwa was declared, Salman Rushdie saying, yeah. Look, you know, I was, you know, I knew I'd written a book that might, I, you know, raise <laughs> an eyebrow or two, but quite honestly, my first response to this fatwa was, I really wish I'd written a more critical book, <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because these people clearly need to be stirred up an awful lot more than something as indirect and anodyne as I'd written. And likewise, you know, I felt I might as well have been hung for a, what's the phrase, hung for a sheep as for a lamb. <laughs> uh, I, I wished that I'd actually had done so. I, I felt I'd said and done nothing that I yeah. regretted. So I could not, it's good to be able to say I actually have done literally nothing wrong. But actually, I wished I had said something much, much stronger and much more overtly honest and critical instead of pussyfooting around, because then I could have said, this is the principle that I have stood by, and this is the principle that you're doing me for, and this is, the, this is what I stand for. And actually, it was really, I, I wished it hadn't been so anodyne. <laughs> yeah, no, it, well, I, I, I'll be able to fill you in on my, because I, I took it, I took it to them, like I, and I'm still taking it to yeah. them. Let's, um, let's pick up, that up again later then, yeah. <laughs> um, so you're, reti you're ret taking retirement. So yeah, so fast forward the clock a little bit. So I, <laughs> so the, the, so the, the, I was in absolutely the pits of despair in April yeah. 2021. What on earth am I going to do? Yeah. Um, and I suppose we were all a bit disturbed at the end of the pandemic. What are we going to do? Lots of people not sure about their futures. So, I mean, basically just about everybody that, that looked out for my best interest was saying, get out now. You can't stay on in academia walking on eggshells. Get out for goodness sake, just leave. Most people saying, sue them for every penny you can get, take them to court yeah. uh, and then get out. And it's just, to be honest, it's just not my nature to have that. You know, I, I don't mind controversies and I, I, I'm quite proud of occasionally whistleblowing when I have to but I don't seek controversy. I am really crap at arguments, <laughs> at, 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 at emotional arguments. I don't I think I'm bad at all arguments, but I'm very bad at emotional arguments. Yeah. Uh, it's not my f strength. Uh, so I just wanted to, it all to go quiet and hang on for as long as I could and see if I could just mend fences. So I avoided any arguments and I've had a year since then and it's actually been a rather lovely year with lots and lots of people across the university and including some really wonderful students who are, many of whom are total strangers to me, expressing really strong solidarities and saying, you know, hang in there, stay on and so on. So 
they, in, in a sense, collectively, they very nearly persuaded me to stay on. But to be honest, it, it is even a relatively tiny event like mine. Mine was sort of over within a week, and then there was about maybe three months worth of press press coverage and a couple more months worth of negotiations. What was I going to do? Because I refused to teach. I said, I'm not going to teach a class of 400 students when I know that probably yeah. 200 of them believe I'm a racist, unless you're, unless the, unless you're going to tell them all yeah. that I'm fully exonerated and I've done nothing wrong and I'm not a racist, misogynist and transphobe. How yeah. could I possibly stand up and teach in a cheerful, relaxed, honest way? So I, I can't do it. And so I've done interesting other stuff. They've kept me in their employment. I was I was suspended for a while, but not without pay. Mm. And then they found, they said, I, you know, you can do what you like for a year. And I said, right, well, I'm going to work positively because my whole shtick has been, you know, like positive, looking at the positive and not, a, 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 and not just be angry all the time about the world. Mm. So I've done a project looking at the role of, curiosity in university and I uh, particularly shared curiosity and the links between that and moral curiosity and people's ability to debate debate difficult issues in open-minded ways and I'm going to write a book on that and it's been an, an interesting year productive year um, and I haven't fallen out with a single person to my knowledge certainly nobody's shouted at me and I don't think anybody has carried on saying he should go um, but I just feel right now, as from today, I'm retired. Now is a good time for me to go quietly and concentrate on other stuff because I, I'm in my 60s anyway. Um, I can probably, so I haven't left the university altogether. I, I've kept on I, I, an honorary fellowship position, unpaid, but do what I can for scholarship, stay interested, stay engaged. I, but I didn't want to burn any bridges. I think if if there is anything slightly unusual about my case, you know, people tend to either stay completely quiet or do the apologies or do whatever it is to 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 survive in academia, yeah. um, and or go the way I think I believe you've gone, which is yeah. get out and there's a bit of a blaze of arguments along the way, which could so easily have happened with me, um, mm. but I think enough people wanted me to to hang in there for, and as I say, I'm averse to argument. So I avoided that. Um, so it's a kind of middle ground. I'm a, 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 and some would say I'm just a fence sitter. I, mm. and that I should have been much more public in my criticisms, but generally, you know, if you're in a university, it's a big university like mine, 45,000 students, I think 10 or 15,000 staff. Mm. Most people are decent. Most people know what a university is for. Most people just want to get on with their lives, teach and learn well. Um, and we shouldn't be held hostage to a very small bunch of uh, attention-seeking activists. Mm. And and the, the the accusations against you, they were all anonymous, right? They were main, nearly all of them anonymous. Some of them had a single first name attached to their, you know, th their Instagram or whatever. And if I'd wanted to, I could have probably yeah. chased up some of those. But I think when you're vulnerable and under attack, the last thing you want to do is give anybody more fuel. So I didn't want to be seen to chase after any of my attackers. I did, I, where I could see opportunities, did post some polite questions back to the people online, yeah. uh, to which they didn't re reply. And I gave them an open invitation, which is still there, to yeah. question me on Twitter. And I've yeah. carried on tweeting every day to make sure that they know that I haven't been cowed in any way. And yeah. I've had none of them questioning me on Twitter. Yeah. So um, I think they quickly realized that they were, were, on, to, were on a hiding to nothing. But yeah. because they had kind of done this ganging up thing and signed a letter saying that they wanted me sacked and I needed to apologize, I think the admi administrators felt they had to respond by suspending me. It's just baffling. It's, well, it's wokeism. It's not baffling when you understand wokeism. But, yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, if like the admin, well, I think the big, it's an interesting question is that if the if administrators just stood up to it would this would this really solve the problem of what we're dealing with here 
So I think it would have taken more than the administrators. I mean, I, 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 I try to, you know, I'm an anthropologist. So I like to see things from lots of people's point of view. Yeah, yeah. So I try to put myself in the shoes of the administrators, including the senior management, so including the principal of the university, the vice chancellor. And, um, I, and I think they might well be right that had they more robustly challenged it, it might have blown up considerably worse. They had one case previously, the rector, which is the kind of the nominal head of our university, yeah. had tried, just as I did a couple of years before, to challenge the uh, specifically transgender activists. Yeah, and yeah. she had been mercilessly harried. And every time she <laughs> spoke out again, it had, it had got worse and worse. So and they had. Who was that? Who was that? So she was called Anne Henderson. So, so we have a, in, in the Scottish universities this position called a rector, which is uh, somebody voted in by the students. Okay. So she was a senior trade unionist, very experienced, uh, very left wing trade unionist. She was voted in on uh, an explicitly left wing trade union ticket to be the yeah. rector, so the, 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 the figurehead of the university okay. who chairs the Senate, which is our you know, major decision making body. Yeah. But she was unable to function for most of her time, and this is all on record, eh, because she was being denounced and sometimes subjected to sort of physical threats for being a transphobe, which of course she wasn't. But like me, she had stood up for JK Rowling yeah. and asked a couple of awkward questions about transgender activism. Yeah. Well, anyway. So, yeah. Well, Neil, it's uh, the hour point is here. Uh, so I know it's hard to believe, but uh, yeah. anyway, I think there's a good segue anyway, because we kind of discussed your case and uh, given people a sense that, you know, like the people who are saying, oh, there's just nothing that, you know, it's it's just a bunch of overblown kind of stuff, this kind of cancel culture thing, you know, they are not paying attention to what yeah. is going on here, because like we just had your case and then Anne Henderson's case and all the other things it's a scotland and then you know kathleen stock in the uk and etc cetera, etc cetera. um anyway so i'll leave it there uh and i'll turn it over to you um, good i mean let me just say just before i ask you something i mean let me just say one final thing on that you know if, if my case and kathleen stock and there's a few others in the press in the uk and of course hundreds in the us and and in uh, canada but um one thing i learned from last year is I mean, I, I had thousands of emails after I, my case went surprisingly public in, in about 30 different newspapers. I had thousands of emails, many from academics in the UK. And overwhelmingly, these were individuals whose cases had not gone public. Yeah. And they, I think, if anything, are far, far more traumatized and distraught than I am because they haven't had that recognition and that solidarity. And all they were doing was going to say, Neil, good luck to you, because I've suffered in silence because I was terrified it would go public. You've yeah. gone public uh, and there's no way back now, but just ca carry on saying what you've been saying. And so there is uh, the, the, people, the cases that we do see that become cause celebre in the newspapers um, are absolutely the tiny tip of the iceberg. That was something that was news to me. I thought I, I had even tweeted a few times saying I thought cancel culture was serious, but was a bit overblown and we shouldn't have a moral panic about it. I now have changed my view on that. Yeah. I think it's much the, the rot is much deeper than than most people suspect. Yeah. So let me can, can I pick up something and just start 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 asking you some stuff? Sure. Well, I I don't know how much detail we need to get into on, on, on your case, because I'm guessing on this podcast, you've already done that a few times. But yes. can I just start by coming back to you? Use, you've used the word anti-woke a few times yeah. and kind of on the assumption that this is an anti-woke platform and that we are anti-woke people coming on it. And I am, I've described myself as a fence sitter. I think I'm probably a fence a fence sitter on that whole concept of woke and whether it's useful and whether so i've been described in the newspapers many times as anti-woke i've had lots of people assuming that i'm anti-woke i i would say i'm a bit more politically non-binary than that <laughs> um, yeah. I, I i don't mind the term no object moral objection to the term woke although some of my colleagues in anthropology definitely have yeah but 
I was one slight worry about it that it's maybe is a bit like left wing and right wing is a bit too much of a shortcut. In the UK until very recently, we would just have said PC. Yeah. And before that, we would have said right on. So the kinds of people that we would have described disparagingly with a boo term like that. What was the last term that you used? A right on. We, uh, this is going back a right long on. way. Right on. When I was a student, if somebody was basically virtue signaling, yeah. trying to be seen to be a bit too uh, much on the side of the underdog and usually from a position of privilege, they're trying to basically apologize for their privilege by fighting for the underdog you yeah. would call them right on. Okay. I, and then PC came along and yeah. we sort of knew that was a joke term, all right? So it wasn't yeah. so much as a, a genuine disparagement term. It's kind of hypothetically, if somebody did believe in political correctness, this is what they would say, but we didn't really think people really believed. So what's new, I think, is that people think that people who espouse woke beliefs really do believe in tramline thinking. They really do believe complex moral debates are settled and there's only one right view. Yeah. I'm, I'm with all of that general kind of critique of virtue signaling, critique of identi uh, uh, um, identity politics, critique of competitive victimology, and intersectionality discourse and so on. Mm. But personally, I wouldn't describe myself as anti-woke and I'm just wondering, have you had arguments about whether that term is useful? Have you had personal yes. doubts about whether it's useful? Yes, yes. So this is, uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, I've, this is my, uh, actually, I'll give a plug for my, <laughs> not sure if you can see that. The Work Academy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is my manuscript uh, and has yeah. the, uh, the knife and the, the book. Uh, so that's uh, a manuscript, right? Yeah, it's my manuscript. Uh, it does exist. Uh, but um, I just, with all the nonsense going on, uh, I haven't, I just can't devote my, it's going to be useful when I come back to it because it, it's looking at it much more theoretically, uh, mm -hmm. whereas I'm right in the thick of things now. So it's hard for me to focus that much on theoretical matters, although it's very helpful when I'm trying to describe things to people and put forward my position. Um, but I have... And I, I didn't like the term woke, and I still don't really like the term woke. Um, but it's just because it's a sh it, it's so recognized and it's so short, it's easier than the other terms that are used that are basically meaning the same thing. And you, it's interesting that you mentioned political correctness because I used to call it, and this is from Jordan Peterson, actually. Jordan Peterson did some psych psychological research and one of his grad students was doing it on um political correct liberals versus political politically correct authoritarians mm. so political political correctness can be have a liberal form or it can have an authoritarian form yes. and i started to call it politically correct totalitarianism because the woke really want are into mind control <laughs> like they're mm. like the like the actual definition of totalitarianism which is not just you know the 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 duvaliers in haiti who just plundered and took the riches out of the country and didn't really care about you know pronoun usage and language and they but the the the, the current woke that they're really trying to get into the language and change how you think about things which is just classic totalitarianism mm. so i used to call it politically correct totalitarianism um, but that's too long a term, unless you went PCT or something like that. Um, Michael Rechtenwald, James Lindsay, and Helen Pluckrose have referred to this as reified postmodernism, which I think is the best academic term because the, the, the nature of that term explains what it is that we're dealing with, which is the kind of um, development of postmodernism that has happened since the 1960s, which has, according to, and this is in cynical theories, I'm not sure if Rechtenwald has these three stages, but that was in cynical theories. Um, deconstructive postmodernism, applied postmodernism, and then reified postmodernism. Those are the three stages. Mm -hmm. and, and this is all my Woke Academy manuscript is really getting into this kind of detail. 
And what happened is, is in the 1960s, we had this relativistic position of postmodernism, subjective, the subjectivity over objectivity. Uh, and this was Foucault and Derrida and all these types. Um, and they really kind of attacked the fundamental sort of enlightenment position. And that's why it's so interesting that David Hume, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, David Hume, one of the greatest philosophers who's ever lived. We're gonna, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you guys and, doing? Um, and in his day, about as woke as you could get, if you, if you, if, if woke, part of woke's meaning means being alive to possibilities yeah. and being alert to uh, to social realities and prepared to speak out yeah. that was david hume in a nutshell <laughs> so anyway so that was the that was the, the initial thing and and that's very important because the relativism disarmed the academy so the academy could no longer protect itself as an intellectual space anymore because of the relativism and this allowed identity politics to move in as a pretending to be an actual academic uh, kind of enterprise when it was pure activism. It was that's all it was was activism. But identity politics coexisted with other academic disciplines and, and actual academic uh, kinds of areas for quite some time, for like decades. And then in 2000s, things started to become totalitarian. Uh, and that's the reified postmodernism. And that's what we're dealing with, with wokeism, mm. is the totalitarian identity politics. And they make no bones about it. <laughs> they yeah. want you out and they will do whatever it takes because you do not have the correct position. The answer has been found and it's just a matter of disseminating that answer to all everyone else in society and students and so on and if you challenge the right answer you are a thought criminal yeah. and you are going to be um removed from the university yeah. and um and that's what happened to me is that because i was uh and and i did like uh, you're you're kind of you're feeling a little bit uh sad that you didn't you know go further <laughs> hmm. I went, I pushed it. Like I you went for it. Yeah. When um when they started to um try to get me to submit, so this is kind of what happens is is and this is the kind of the difficulty of academics is that you know I you know academics are you know if you are a true academic, you, you want to be open and you don't want to you know close things off and so on and and, and the woke use that against you. Hmm. So I just, um, actually, I, 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 my um, inspiration was, uh, I'm not sure if you know the, um, the series Breaking Bad. Yes. <laughs> Is there's I a don't... great poster of Walter White. Mm -hmm. And I used to have this on my Facebook page. Actually, I, it was part of the harassment. All right. <laughs> against me. It, it says, uh, there's a famous scene in Breaking Bad where, um, uh, uh, Skyler Walter White's uh, spouse says to him, "You know, are we in danger?" And uh, he goes, "I am not in danger. I am the danger." He says to her. So I was like taking this. I am not. When people would say, "Oh, they get all worried and everything about me," and oh, I go, "I am not in danger. I am the danger." And so I just lean in, and I would I would use whatever they were doing, the woke, and use it against like. Like, like, try to find methods, and satire was the method that I used, satirical methods to, to kind of, you know, kind of try to off make them off balance, and then, and then if I got complaints that were successful against me, I filed eighteen complaints against my colleagues using the same, like using the standard that had been used mm -hmm. against me, and so now. Um, I've gone through five investigations. Uh, three where I was the respondent and two where I was the complainant. And all the investigation reports, and, and as well, the other good thing about my case is um, because 
there's two people who got pushed out before me. One person who had his life destroyed. Mm -hmm. It was really sad, sad case. And and none, and and people who could have supported him never found out about it until after it had been done. And and he was told he couldn't talk to anyone about it. And uh, he was the, like the the most principal academic. He was a great scholar. He's suffering from you know post traumatic stress disorder, just like just awful. So I saw, I heard about that. And I thought, oh, and then um, another guy, Mark Hecht, who was a contract faculty member, uh, wrote an op-ed in the Vancouver Sun in September 2019, um, saying that too much ethnic diversity undermines social trust, which comes out of quite a robust sociological mm -hmm. literature anyway. A whole bunch of woke people went nuts and denounced him in a private letter, 30 of them signed it, hmm. administration. We still don't know who signed that letter and we're probably never gonna know. Oh. Um, anyway, he was he his field school was, um, was canceled. So he got pushed out of Mount Royal. So I was watching this happening. And, um, one of, and, and the other good thing about my case is I have a very good team working behind the scenes. Anyway, one of my advisors told me in, Quite early on, like, you know, years ago, whenever you say anything in public, make sure you record it because you're going to get nailed. They mm. will, they'll make stuff up about you. They'll, they'll, you know, say things that you didn't say, et cetera. You've got to have a record of that. So uh, on uh, September, 2019, I bought a recorder on a way to a talk. So I was going actually on the way to a talk, bought a recorder, recorded the talk in which I asked a question about indigenous star knowledge. Mm -hmm. That question became one of the, the allegations against me in a harassment complaint. And if I hadn't had that recording, yeah. I could, oh, I would have, I would have, you know, yeah. much, well, I still had problems, but I would have had other problems. And since that time, September 2019, I've recorded everything that's happened. All the state Star Chamber inquisitions, they're all recorded. So I have about 30 hours of recordings of the Star Chamber. The best one, which I haven't released at this, I haven't released any of them because I'm I have to be careful about what I release before arbitration because it could be seen as like that I'm not acting properly or something. Anyway, the best one is a the last meeting that I had with the provost before my termination, where the provost tried to get me to accept responsibility and show remorse. Yes. Oh, gosh. And yeah. it's classic 1984. It is just unbelievable. I just listened to it again because I'm, I, it's, it's got some names mentioned in it, which I'll have to somehow edit out if I'm going to release it because I've sort of made up my mind that I can talk about people, faculty members who've left Mount Royal, two of them, Renee Watchman and Liam Haggerty, who are no longer at Mount Royal, who were mm -hmm. the instigators of much of the mobbing that happened. Um, but everyone else who's still at Mount Royal, I'm, I'm not going to mention by name. I'm not going to, because like, I, I want to, I'm, I'm demanding to be reinstated and I should be reinstated. Uh, but they're going to try to argue in arbitration that the employment relationship is no longer viable. Uh, and my, my position is that, you know, I have no, I see it as a, a massive structural problem. I don't have any, I'm not going to, take issue with any people who are at Mount Royal, except as just a general, I have a right as an academic to ask academic questions when things don't seem to me to be upholding the standards of the university. And it's nothing personal against those people. They're, they're trying to tr make you into something personal, but it's not. Anyone who makes irrational claims without evidence should be asked to substantiate the claims yes. that we're making and and that got turned into harassment allegations yes. against me, this kind of thing as so, well as a, as well as an academic procedural thing yeah. i mean it's also a, 
a, a moral and common sense social thing. If you want to show respect to somebody else as a full human being, you should be free and willing to challenge their views when you disagree. And if you don't, it's actually d ironically dis disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, and particularly if over a long period you refuse to challenge somebody because you think they're in a cat protected category that shouldn't be challenged, that is quite clearly, as the phrase that I used before was the, you know, the bigotry of low expectations. It is, it is racist, it's disparaging, it's dehumanizing. Yeah. Um, whereas to criticize and question, provided you do so in good, in good faith and in good uh, and in the right place at the right time and so on, I think is is one of our best ways of showing respect to our fellow humans. Yes. Um, and uh, my colleagues... comes back to, I mean, I, sir, I would agree with your point about recording stuff. And I you know if, if anyone's watching this who's worried uh, about something or is, is undergoing something similar. Yes, I think uh, having um, unambiguous uh, evidence in your defense is a really important thing. I, two provisors. One is I just be a little careful because people can I challenge you and uh, legally for recording something without their knowing. No, they're uh, not in Canada. So that's, that's something right. to check out yeah. in the law. So you first right. of all, you should get the legal thing straight. Yeah. So in Canada, we have what's called a one party recording uh, rule. So all right. you, have, you have to be there. You have to be present uh, in the meeting. You can't just leave a recorder in a room yeah. and leave. Okay. So you have to be actually uh, there doing yeah. it. Um, and as long as the person who's recording is there, you can do it. Um, so there's nothing. Now, there's a difference, of course, between recording and releasing those recordings. Mm -hmm. So that's something to yes. keep in mind as well is that, you know, I know many, many faculty members now who record classes, everything. They, they, yeah. Because they're afraid that something that they say, especially if they're doing sort of controversial materials, anyone who's doing controversial materials, you know, you've got to, well, and in your case, it's, this is the scary thing is that now it doesn't even have to be someone who's a controversial figure who's doing mm -hmm. it. You know, you just make the wrong joke or you say the, you know, whatever. Um, so many people I know, they, they record everything. Yeah. All, you know things and they just keep it and if something comes up it's there it's there uh you know now uh, if nothing else just being able to say look i have all the evidence and in my case it really helped to be able to say and so do you you know because all the evidence yeah. So I was, you know, accused of saying stuff on Twitter. All right, so Twitter's there. Anyone can look. They haven't found a single tweet that is in any way uh, seriously controversial. So that was there. And then, of course, they failed on that. So they thought, well, we better justify our complaint. So they started trying to invent or go and gather stories about uh, academic feedback are given. As it happens, nowadays in Edinburgh University, probably like in, in yours, uh, um, all our feedback is, is written and recorded and filed and anyone can access it. So, um, so it, you know, it would have taken a matter of minutes to check up any allegations against me. And, and it really helped that I was able to, to say so. You know, a couple of students said, oh, but he didn't give me a first class mark on my essay because my essay was on race and he's a race denialist. Well, I'm not a race denialist and I never said anything like that. And the, the feedback record is, is, is there for everybody to, to, to see. So that really did help, but it didn't give me protection complete protection from allegations people can still just make stuff up yeah. but um, yeah 10 years ago when there wasn't that kind of track record i would have been terrified yes. because uh, they could have just made up any old shit and if there was enough of them their version against mine yeah. i would have been in deep deep shit basically yeah. yeah no um it's a very difficult terrain now um you know i don't quite know to know what to say to people who are not feisty uh like i am very feisty so um i'm not i will not submit to them and they are i'm gonna take it the whole they're gonna everyone is gonna well the big battle now is to get the arbitrate so my arbitration is in um uh january 16th to 27th so there's gonna be 10 hearing days mm -hmm. um and i got fortunately the canadian association of university teachers which is the the main union that that is the union of all the the actual faculty association unions they've taken over the legal side of it so it's a big it's a high profile case right uh 
But the problem is, is that uh, the university wants the arbitration to be private uh, when it should be public. Absolutely. Because yeah. um, universities are publicly funded. Uh, they're all created by statutory. Everything in the, the dispute has been created by by statute. Uh, so it's it's all kind of legally determined, which is comes under public sort of sort of the public law kind of principle. Um, and if it's not public, it means that all the documents that I have will not be able to be made public. They'll be mm. sealed, and it's going to be up to the arbitrator to come to his decision based upon, you know, his interpretation of those documents. And that means that there's going to be no oversight. There's not going to be no open court principle. There's not going to be no transparency. Um, it's going to be a very and I'm 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 going to fight I'm going to fight tooth and nail uh, for this to be public because we have to uh, all universities in Canada have to understand what is sort of going on with all this control all these controls on what you're able to talk about mm. in universities like the, the, it's becoming very very constrained now on a whole bunch of different issues and we've talked about a number of them trans activism and you know anti-racism stuff and indigenization being some of them but there's other issues as well um and you know we we have to be able to understand where things have gone wrong in these institutions and my case is an excellent case because um, although I've been somewhat unorthodox in how I <laughs> I haven't been like you know I have not been you know well behaved in the sense of you know being very nice and deferential and trying to you know I've just when someone's pushed against me I push back harder so hmm. it's like you know, it's like it, it's just like this ongoing kind of escalation, which I will just continue to give back as good as I get. But nothing that I've done, um, and and it all started. I should mention as well that it all began my satirical, what I call my satirical warfare, uh, began when the mob formed and tried to get was trying to get me fired. So similar to yourself anonymous student group actually it's it's a, it's remarkable how similar it is mm -hmm. um, a uh, anonymous student group called racial advocacy mru and then a faculty anonymous faculty twitter account mru anti racism started a campaign to try to get me fired mm -hmm. so th they they started this in i guess it was uh around June 2020. And at that time, I was just completely straight academic. I was just asking questions. I was never doing this satirical stuff. And then um, when they tried to get me fired, when they tried to mobilize to, to get me fired, then I invented this Twitter character called Francis McGrath. Yes. No, I was I was fascinated by that. I was going to ask you more, but uh, carry on, because that's one of the things I think was that has been really interesting about your fight back is yeah. your use of that, you know, the, the satire idea and your recognition of the power of satire. Um, yeah. and, uh, obviously, in the UK, we have uh, Andrew Doyle and Titania McGrath as a. That was modeled on. So that's protege. what happened. So I've been following Titania McGrath for several, I was a big fan, obviously. Mm -hmm. And actually, some of the things I got. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure, but it wasn't specifically mentioned, but it definitely for full men. It was just that I would read. So I was, my character is su supposed to be Titania McGrath's sister-in-law, sister mm -hmm. with an X. So right. and Francis, <laughs> has an X, Francis with an X. And as right. well, it's now lowercase letters, except for the X, because it's yeah. anti-oppressive, because our administrator who's in charge of indigenization and decolonization put out an announcement one day that everything in in her office was now going to be lower case because lower right. case was the way to combat oppression it was yeah. enough you know like this kind of you know really like this is this is not going to do anything to address the terrible conditions of the indigenous population for 
you know, this office to be using lowercase letters. Not to mention yeah. it being very confusing in discussions because yeah. sometimes things, if they're not, cap we have capitalization for a reason to understand things. Yeah. Anyway, the unfortunate thing about this, and this shows you how terrible things are, is when she announced that she was going to be having the lowercase letters, uh, it got, it went viral on Twitter. And she got just like, there was a deluge of hate mail that she right. got because of this so you know like this whole toxicity of social media just it, it's hard to know what to do about it anyway so that that's kind of a background to that anyway um so and uh titania mcgrath would would have some tweets and i would retweet titania mcgrath's tweet you know sort of congratulating my sister-in-law for yes. her, whatever and one of them which was one of the ones which the students got really upset about was um to Tanya McGrath's tweet where uh, Titania is dressed in a, in lingerie and she has a cab on. Right. Oh, dear. And she's holding this sign saying <laughs> sluts for Islam yeah. and says, uh, please join me on my slut walk against Islamophobia, which, uh -huh. you know, of course, anyone who's paying attention to that knows that Doyle is drawing attention to the contradiction and in, in yeah. uh, intersectionality. If you're a feminist and you're supporting Islam, and so like it just is trying yeah. to get at that. So I retweeted this with my own commentary, saying, um, "Way to go! My sister-in-law is again leading the way." Uh, if you are, if if anyone who is a, a feminist, if you're going to be a real uh, an actual feminist, you must support Islamicism. Members of ISIS are some of the most oppressed. <laughs> some have even been jailed for their beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I, I posted that. And of course, all the, the students uh, yeah. all went crazy and said, you know, that I was making the campus unsafe and that, you know, like all this, you know, that like, and, and this is all like, it's on my private, like, this is the thing was, was I was sort of thinking at the time is that I'm not doing it on, well, first of all, Mount Royal has no social media policy. So we're not like Edinburgh. We don't, nothing. Mm -hmm. And since I had been, you know, subjected to all sorts of attacks over several years and had let the administration know about it um, and no one did anything about it, I assumed that, you know, social media was not an area that was going to be regulated uh, by Mount Royal. And so, um, you know, now anything I do on my Twitter account, my Facebook account is, you know, this is making students who are going to be taking classes from me or just students generally are going to be feeling that the campus is an unsafe space and that they can't, you know, do this and that. So, so this is kind of the difficulty is that, you know, social media, uh, was thought to be, as long as you don't identify yourself as being uh, representing the university, is supposed to be your own private kind of time. And, and yeah. why then are universities insisting that everything that you do in your private life, not as a university employee, not as university business, is something that they should be regulating and something that they should be hauling you before the star chamber on. So mm. this is a big issue, of course, in this case that's going to be coming in, in January. So Francis, can I ask you then, I don't want to try to elicit uh, any kind of spoilers about your, your book, but is there, is, is there a chapter on this in your book on, on, on humor in, in political debate? Um, there's, there's not uh, in it as it is right now. So um, actually I have two kind of books, two manuscripts. Well, one of them is not very well formed. One of them is on my case. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, that's going to be more where that's going to come in when I'm directly talking. Um, I think that one's called uh, When the Academy Goes Woke or something like uh -huh. that. You know, my case, my my particular case at Mount Royal. This one's more theoretical. Um, and it's talking about actually it's um, looking at what's called advocacy studies programs. Mm -hmm. So queer studies, indigenous studies, black studies, women's studies, you know, disability studies, 
Um, that's what happened in the starting in the late 60s, but going through is that these um, areas, which have identity politics as the basis for their uh, organization, that was the beginning of the end for the university. And it started mm. out where they were, um, you know, coexisting with mm. the university, but then they just gradually kind of had this expansionary sort of thing and then took over, eventually took over the machinery of the administration with, you know, diversity offices and so on. So that's what that manuscript script is on looking at those. Yes. And, I, and I have, um, you know, my own uh, skirmishes, which I had with respect, because almost on every single one of these issues, I had some kind of run in at Mount Royal University about yeah. it. So I'm kind of doing that. But with my other manuscript, that's going to be on my case specifically. And the satirical aspect is going to be something that's looked mm. at in that, because in that, that, that's a big part of my situation is that satire cannot exist in a climate of wokeness. Mm -hmm. Wokeness, it cannot tolerate satire. Sure. Uh, because, and, and I really think satire is almost the only way to combat wokeism. I, like I, I'm still like, I'm still kind of thinking through this because at the time in 2020, when I started it, uh, I, I was just reacting. So I, I, I didn't have any kind of overarching plan or anything like that. I just was trying to figure out how to kind of engage with all these people making these accusations. And then it just kind of snowballed because what would happen is that I would do the satire, a satirical tweet. I would get this barrage of response from all these angry woke people mm. And then I would kind of synthesize their response and amp it up a little bit and then present it back. Yeah. And so it was just like, it was just kind of getting completely cra crazed. And I, I think that's why the university sort of decided to, you know, that they couldn't, they just couldn't handle it. Like it was just, it was beyond their ability to manage because yeah. they were so, they had failed so terribly. Like, it's like what you, what happened to you is that, instead of dealing with it properly, which I don't buy that they're trying to protect you. I don't, I think it was pure wokeism cannot tolerate discussion. They want to manage it. So this is what we see now with the universities is there's this group called, and, and it's in the literature, it's called diversity managerialism. So mm -hmm. they want to clamp down on anything that is going to, uh, be uh, negative for the university's brand, whatever that brand might be. And the brand in many universities now is not academic excellence. The brand is some kind of, you know, wokest kind of thing. So they want to clamp down on everything. And so uh, what they do is they is they they try to get you into some kind of secretive process is generally what they do, which is like yeah. the worst possible thing because it kind of stops the safety valve from from being used. Like like a lot of these these young people, they're they're acting out. Many have mental health problems. Whatever is going on with them, they need to blow off steam, and you know, fine. Like like the, I, I'm always in favor of. Hey, you can go ahead. The problem is that you're not able to respond. To you. So it's like now you got to yeah. be. It, have it used as a battering ram again or so something to beat you over the head with when it should be the administration should be proactively trying to channel these kinds of outbursts into a more productive academic exchange yeah. uh, i think it, perhaps the strongest apart from because you say you know satire is is the only effective way of fighting certain kinds of totalitarian ideology uh, I think that's that's true, but I think it, there's an awful lot more conversations to be had about how it's effective and why and when. And when I look at the, I mean, I have limited appetite for endless spending the rest of my days talking about free speech and f 
polarized politics and wokery and so on. I, I don't, I, I want to partition that bit of my life <laughs> for my next 10, 20, how many years I have left. So let's say it's 10% of my days. I, if I wanted to choose how much of that, how to spend that time wisely, I would shift more of my attention to humor and satire. Mm. And just because it's much, much more interesting. So for example, in terms of getting, cutting across political div divisions, where you've got two communities who just can't talk to each other, yeah. humor is a potential common ground. Because actually making a joke about somebody, if you make it in the right place at the right time, yeah. is apart from anything else is a way of showing that you you think they're part of they're a human being who's part of your moral community um uh, it can be a way simply of disparaging people and sometimes that's needed so for example when come when people do you know uh, are just being ridiculous with their ideology we need to expose that and ridicule it and satire does that well but sometimes humor can just raise important ambigu amb ambiguous things make people laugh and therefore relax in a space where otherwise they would just be only angry. And so I think the power of, there's lots of interesting angles that we have on, yeah. on the role of humor in these debates. It's true and, and, and my, uh, my own approach is, uh, and, and Andrew Doyle talks about this, so I've been listening to quite a bit of what Andrew Doyle, because I, I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit of an understanding of his own position on satire um, and I just wrote about this in Minding the Campus today on um, you know because I listened to a couple of Andrew Drill and Andrew Drill made some really good points about wokeism so the problem with wokeism is not only that it is irrational it also lacks any sense of humor mm. it doesn't have a sense of humor so I think that's why satire is effective because it it's a way of kind of getting it in an uncomfortable thing of having to maybe laugh at itself but it can't do that mm -hmm. so it, it, it just becomes kind of deranged um but he said which i think is very true that the, my satire the point of my satire is not to communicate with the woke at all like I've, mm -hmm. I've written them off like they are not like they cannot engage in rational discourse and they really have to just become not woke anymore like woke has to end and if they want to continue on with the identity politics and stuff well that's fine but that's going to have to be the non-totalitarian version of identity politics like mm. they have to accept other positions within the university and if they can't they should not they should not be there but what my satire does is it, it it's kind of a taboo busting kind of mm. exercise like and i do lots of and I'm still working on this because sometimes it works and I don't quite know the see Andrew Doyle's much better at it than me because I'm sort of slightly impatient. So mm -hmm. I kind of go to the go to the jugular sometimes really, really quickly when being more subtle might be more effective. Um, but I've done some ones which well, the, the slut walk one. Well, that was that was Titania McGrath that was the beginning of it, uh, which was one of the more in your face kind of Titania McGrath ones. Um, but the one that got me into real trouble was the, um, we're having a big controversy now in Canada, which is just starting to to unravel on the unmarked graves of Indigenous children, at, supposedly, yes, yeah. uh, which is a fabrication, uh, mm -hmm. seems to be. Like, it, it just is very suspicious. It's a rent-seeking race hustling exercise and because there's so much deference that's given to what i call neo-tribal elites no one was challenging it at all and so mm. all sorts of very ridiculous accusations were being made including um you know presidents of universities were saying you know the bodies of 215 children found and so on there's no there's no bodies found there's there's no it's it's soil disturbances and in the case that i'm working on kamloops case it's had uh, massive excavations ha have happened on the site for 100 years so you can't tell the difference between excavations hmm. that were done for ditches irrigation ditches and graves and so on anyway so it's it's and and they have rep i have a report on this 
that was done with the ground penetrating radar, they, they won't release the report. They've put a gag over gag order on the Simon Fraser Archaeology Department. They can't discuss the case. They've a bunch of race hustlers have just castigated anyone who asks any questions about it and, and sort of say these things like, you're demanding to see the bodies of dead children and like all this kind of like you guys are just anyway when some of these people were going after people who wanted to celebrate canada day and telling them um that they were disgusting genocide minimizers for wanting to send, c celebrate canada day to take their kids to the fireworks or whatever so that's when francis mcgrath um, Ma did a a really edgy tweet saying, uh, you know, for those of you who want to say it, self celebrate Canada Day after hearing about the killing fields, you're disgusting genocide uh -huh. minimizers. Why don't you celebrate Hitler's birthday while you're at it? Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, so like this is I'm trying to like break. The hysteria break the whole totalitarianism with just a, a like a fist, like a like a, a very very strong, in your face kind of uh, showing the kind of ridiculousness of the comparison between the residential schools and Auschwitz, basically. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is crazy. This kind of comparison, yeah. like the residential oh. schools had many many problems. They were underfunded. They they disrespected Indigenous people. Like they didn't they didn't they weren't sensitive and so on. There was sexual abuse and all these things, but they weren't Auschwitz. Like they weren't trying to exterminate people. Like yeah. that's not what was happening. So that was, I think, what I, I mean. I, I I followed it a little bit, and as an as as a foreigner, I don't know all the details, and I haven't followed it for years and years. So, uh, but. From what little I have gathered, what seems terribly sad about that story is that for some people, it's it's not it's not enough to 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 have a kind of healthy criticism of a moral shortcomings. Those moral shortcomings have to be so stark and so dire that they are absolutely on the same level as Auschwitz. It's almost like they, they wish the past was worse than it was and so very similar in the history of British colonialism there's clearly you know just about every anthropologist worth their salt would agree in principle with educating a uh, students about a uh, all aspects of colonialism including the unsavory uh, details and the suffering and the injustice and the horrible mistakes and so on but it seems that the the current generation of activists want the whole colonial era to be one giant genocide and nothing <laughs> nothing else yeah and it's a bit like a bit like back to david hume they they the activists who denounced him and would have pulled his statue down if they could have done but uh, instead they want to just rip his name off the tower yeah. um they, they wanted him to be an absolute devil they did not want, want him to be a basically a largely good enlightenment philosopher who had some opinions that would have been dodgy today <laughs> yeah I, I i'm amazed and i don't I'm, like this whole thing about you have to be this absolutely squeaky clean everything you say has to be you know have this level of purity mm -hmm. you know i don't think anyone can live up to that stand and that's why it's these people who are pressing for this you know you're going to be next like like everyone's going to be taken down at some point mm -hmm. here like instead of sort of saying okay uh people say things which you know maybe they would have said differently or maybe even they wouldn't say differently but instead of getting them fired and so on you know, engage with them and talk to them and so on. Um, it's like they're irredeemable and they've they've just stepped on this wrong thing and now they're just mm -hmm. we just want to get rid of them like that. That's yeah. uh, in which I don't think, especially in universities, is a you know maybe in politics and so on like that's different rules there. But in universities, I, I well we used to be 
a place where you could be wrong. Like, yes, you you have a right to be wrong. And, you know, you're going to be people are going to engage with you and they're going to provide you with evidence that's going to show you how you're wrong. And then you hopefully if you are an, have an academic mindset, you're going to change your view and, and, and have yeah. a better position like that sort of thing. Yeah. But now it's like, OK, you see the wrong thing and and you're going to you're basically going to be canceled and erased sure. and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a I phrase that I guess would have got, will have been used in your case. So certainly used in my case. Was the phrase was I, I didn't I, I had to resign because I didn't align with the values of anthropology. A clearer statement of the belief in tramline thinking could yeah. not have been made. And that same phrase, funnily enough, was just used again yesterday in the Edinburgh Festival. We have this big cultural arts festival in Edinburgh, yeah. and the biggest part of it nowadays is what used to be called the Fringe, which was meant to be edgy comedy. And it was then edgy comedy became edgy theatre, edgy music, and then it got bigger and bigger. It's become most of the festival is the fringe nowadays. So yeah. yesterday there was a comedian whose show had just been cancelled by its promoters, um, by its own promoters. They just said he's cancelled from now on because some some people complained about something offense, an offensive joke last night. <laughs> uh, and they said we had to cancel him because it's clear he doesn't align with our values. Same phrase. Yes. And the no idea that a comedian ought to align with the values of, of the <laughs> the business I know. And, and like it's these so are her, like the, the thing about comedy you know co comedy and, and and that's why i think there's some helpful you know exchange between satire and academia and so on mm. it's because both of those areas you know kind of prize innovation and creativity and this sort of thing and this is being killed like this yeah. wokeism is killing that. And it's not just the people who get pulled or canceled. It's all the people who now are going to think, I better not, maybe I better not tell that joke or maybe I meant mm. better not, you know, have, because that, that could result in this. So everything, you know, the people who get canceled are just on the tip of the iceberg. And then there's the whole thing beneath the surface, which is people being afraid to express their opinions and you know make a joke that's slightly tasteless or whatever um, in Canada there is some good news on this front I'm not sure if you heard about this but um, uh, there was a there's a bit of very very important case regarding a comedian in Quebec whose name is Mike Ward um, who uh, got sued by uh, taken before a human rights commission in order to pay forty thousand dollars for a a joke, uh, an insensitive joke that he uh, he made about a, a, a someone, a, a younger person who'd become a public figure mm. because of a, a deformity he had in his face. And mm. so it was because he was a public figure that the comedian, and he was being trotted out at all these events because all the virtue sig signalers wanted to show how, you know, open they were to having you know disabled people you know being the face of their event anyway he he made some tasteless joke about this and uh, he was taken before the human rights commission he was he was found to have violated the human rights of this public figure mm -hmm. he went before the supreme court and the supreme court decided in ward's favor right. barely it mm -hmm. was i think five four <laughs> saying right. just because you make a tasteless joke about especially a public figure i'm not sure if it's just a private individual that does not mean that you are discriminating against that person like that's what they argued and that was what was being used and a result of that decision a whole bunch of cases that had gone to the human rights commission now were were basically hmm. ended so that kind of was a little sure. bit of a because yeah. almost by definition, you can't know the moral intentions of the joker. You know, you yeah. can, yeah, the, the joke is there to, to allow all kinds of possible uh, reactions. And that's, that's where its power comes from. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, on the, I mentioned the resisting whiteness event. My response was to, be, to use reason and rational and said, I, so I commented very sternly saying, I, you, you call yourselves anti-racists but you're, segre you're racially segregating white from non-white yeah. uh, and you're uh, using a, a sort of deliberate racial discrimination to disallow white people the might. That, that's what I would call racism. So I, I had a rational and what I thought was a powerful argument. 
uh, um, Titania McGrath simply tweeted, oh, and uh, have you thought of bussing in the, the non-white people in separate buses and having separate drinking fountains? Actually, an infinitely more powerful response yeah. well, than any kind of rational argument. And, and, and uh, I, I just was, I forgot to say something very important that Andrew Doyle had said as well in one of these interviews, which I think is very important for satire in the case of wokeness. Woke, the people who are woke take the position of being the underdog mm -hmm. all the time. This is the difficulty of it. This is why it's so difficult to deal with them is because they assume this posture of being the underdog and fighting mm -hmm. against the oppressor. And that makes it, it, people very reluctant to challenge them and to stand up to their bullying because mm -hmm. it feels like you're siding with the oppressor if you if you uh, go after them. So satire is kind of a way of kind of dealing with that kind of posture. And it's it's it, it, I've seen this many, many times in my dealings with this, this kind of woke phenomenon is um, these people are attacking you, right? But mm. they're acting like they're the ones who are the victims in the whole yeah. thing. And, and, and it's uh, the term is cryable. They're, they're yeah. what's called a cryable. So they're bullying. I, yeah, I've, I've used that term as well, as well yeah. And but so it, just, satire uh, is a way of kind of like dealing with this cryable kind yeah. of phenomenon and kind of loosening it up so people don't have this kind of fear and then they see the satire kind of poking fun at it or kind of going at it. Mm -hmm. um, so like I think this is very interesting and I, I'm, I'm studying it more and more because I don't I see some of my tweets, some of them are good, some of them are not good. And I don't quite know what it is that I'm doing in the good ones that makes them better mm -hmm. than the other ones. I don't know. And and my tweets are very, they're not as subtle as to Tanya McGrath. Like like she she has this more, um, this character is more, yeah. got that kind of unctuous, niceness like it's kind of this nice like this kind of niceness that is not you know uh you know a anti-oppressive or it, it's a niceness that is oppressive and yeah it's done in this kind of way but anyway I, i'm not very good at that so i just have this my my, my um tactic is to kind of slightly exaggerate things hmm. like like i don't know it's it's, it's not i very think specific. i so i think anyone who wants to uh fight totalitarian political movements and even as a critical friend from within can learn a huge amount from someone like Andrew Doyle yes. and I mean, we could talk endlessly with, I'm sure we're coming to the end of our two hours but just one just to add one thing and we've talked a little bit about the power of satire to kind of uh, pull the rug out from under the feet of totalitarians but I think the other direction that that joking works which is really interesting is is on your own psychology as a as a complainer so I mentioned, I mentioned that I don't think, one of the reasons I don't pick fights, I'm not a born controversialist, I get, when I think I'm right and other people are stupidly wrong, I get really angry and dogmatic myself very, very easily. Uh, and I do think it's crucial for your own psychology to be able to see the funny side of every argument that you, that you have. And so satire and joking and irony, when used well, can actually... I presume make you be much better able to argue. So if you watch a um, Andrew Doyle, just as Andrew Doyle, he argues in a beautifully calm, persuasive, but yeah. always pleasant and smiley yeah. way. Yeah, really, great. really superb to yes. watch. And I should mention one thing, because we are almost at our end. But um, the other good thing to do, uh, which doesn't work with wokeness, but it, it works with trying to get past the sort of nastiness that tends to go on. And you notice this on social media. Is, uh, and I like I have all this, this sort of stuff happening on Facebook. I, I My Facebook account is where I try to go into some discussions with people. Mm -hmm. And I'll have people on there who are being very nasty. Um, and the worst thing you can do in those situations is to start to become nastier yourself. Mm -hmm. Because then it just, things break down. The thing to do is what's called, um, and it's Peter Bogosian who's who's an expert at this. Mm. 
um, who just got pushed out of Portland State. <laughs> Portland State University, but he's now, you know, on to better things, et cetera, um, is what's called street epistemology. Yeah. And there's a guy by the name of Anthony Magna Bosco, who I had the pleasure of inviting to Mount Royal when I was still a professor there, who does, has a whole series where he engages with people who have, you know, all sorts of irrational views. It's largely religion, but it would work well to some extent with some of these others, is that you just start to, one, make sure people are de defining their terms. So often what happens is that you, you start off with different kinds of definitions. So, and the second thing is to, to, to repeat back what you think the other person is arguing, to make sure that you're both on the same page. Yeah. And, and those kinds of things can kind of tone down the, like the, the volume here and, and get it back into an intellectual yeah. kind of dynamic again. So I think those kinds of things, we have to be kind of thinking about that now because things have yeah. broken down, seriously broken For down. Sure. So what, what I've liked about Peter Boghossian street epistemology is exactly that last one. I mean, lots of people try to do that, putting their, 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 their uh, their version of, of what they think the other person is arguing. But it's so easy to do that in bad faith. And I think from what I've seen, Peter Boghossian does it in really good faith. You yeah, know, he's, he simplifies, yeah. he clarifies, yeah. uh, he gives everybody a chance to air their, their, their views. And yeah. I imagine that's very, very disarming. You know, that, that if, if you're and disposed is... to hate him and to shout at him, yeah. you would, he would stop and make you think. Yeah. No, and I think that's 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 a couple of possibilities for the future. Mm. Two hours are up. Good. Well, Francis, thank you very much for inviting me on. Yes, thank you very um, much. This is great. I'm glad we're finally getting over into other, uh, you know, other continents, and and you know, because I think it's it's a global. Well, certainly within. Western universities, this is a massive problem. I don't know how much in yeah. France and other areas, but uh, the English speaking world, uh, certainly Australia, big problems there as well. So um, the more, you know, we can raise the alarm about, yeah. you know, the threats to open inquiry in universities uh, everywhere where it's happening, the better people can have a, start to develop a, a better uh, uh, kind of perspective on what to do to try to, you know, get things back onto an intellectual level um, yeah. in the various academic institutions. But anything that you would like to say, I should just give you an opportunity at the end, uh, Neil, to say anything that you think uh, that we didn't cover or that you think should be mentioned. There's nothing particular. I mean, just my overall feeling, I absolutely agree that you're right to press hard on this. And I think what you're doing is really, uh, is really, really helpful. Um, I doubt if I will pursue that line myself now in my <laughs> retirement, not very much. I say I want to keep it a small amount, but partly my reasons for not wanting to get too exercised for too much of the rest of my days over cancel culture and woke is personally, I, I don't want to, I don't like victimology. I don't like, like competitive victimhood. So wouldn't like to be seen primarily as a victim myself. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be remembered for having a few interesting things to say about happiness <laughs> or social quality. Uh, and, and secondly, although I, you know, I'm alarmed for sure about certain ideological movements, not just in universities, but in businesses and in governments, they are very alarming. And there's a sign of kind of extreme dumbing down and extreme totalitarianism and lots of areas of moral debate. So we do need to fight that. I think humor is one of the more promising fight backs. But also, I do think that the future of universities is not as gloomy as some people think. I think most people in universities are still doing good stuff, providing a good space for good open debate. And there are some areas where it's very difficult to have a good conversation right now, but generally they're not in as awful health as the doom mongers say. We'll have to agree to disagree on that point. Right. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to thank you very much uh, for joining me today on the Rational Space Disputations. Good. Thank you very much. I'll speak again soon, I hope.